It's a good thing I said I do in the car. <clears throat> I was a little worried at first I didn't know how hot it was going to be at the moment. I had bizarre visions of my camera just melting to the dashboard. <laughs> it's actually, it's not that bad for a beautiful day like this. So yeah, this is being filmed in standard def, so that way I can get this out and about. So um, this will probably be a quick break from the widescreen videos I normally do. I had a crazy, crazy month so far. There. I had a crazy month so far. <laughs> like, oh, on top of everything else. Um, Newbury Comics closing down. Uh, which, already dead. Movie stopped going out of business, apparently. And uh, the fact that my Facebook has been disabled. Which makes for a uh, pretty interesting story. <laughs> Which is also the reason why the the vaulting Facebook is down. I, I don't think I'll be real. I don't think I'll rebuild a new one. To, to put that time and effort and energy, when there's other things to do. It's you'll you'll still get news on the uh, Mr. Coat and Friends group if you're part of that, or Twitter, which I'll probably have like maybe a little link down here somewhere. I still blog on the Blockbuster Chronicles. That's a bit of a plus. Uh, it's just for now, with um, Facebook out of the question, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting. Still get videos, hopefully. <laughs> um, yeah, where to begin? Okay, so I had a choice between two movies this weekend. Uh, one was X Men Apocalypse, and the other was this one. And of course, as always, to prove that I saw this one, there we go. It's called Alice Through. But it's really Alice Through the Looking Glass. Um, I had a choice between this one and X-Men Apocalypse, and I didn't do Apocalypse for a couple of reasons. Um, I already saw Batman vs. Superman and Captain America vs. Civil War, and those were the two I was really hyped to see. But for Apocalypse, it was an entirely different story. Um, I'm not big in the X-Men. I do admire the franchise, say the least. But it's one of those series that I'm not, like, too in, in focused with or, you know, that into, um, but I, do, I, I see once in a while, I, I rent them on DVD and stuff, so it was a bit of a, a cat flap choice, either go with the franchise that I, I, I think is okay, but don't really have like a huge love for, um, or the other one, which didn't look that interesting, and was getting really pinned down by critics as a bad film, <laughs> um, but I, but I heard on some accounts there's some enjoyable moments with it. So I kind of went with the basic gullet being, you know, I like fantasy. I like fantasy movies. I like going into different realms. And just uh, went for the one that I felt would be more interesting to talk about. Um, I know people are going to rag at me and say, Oh, you should have seen X-Men Apocalypse. You should have known that was a horrible film. In a nutshell, uh, this this movie, Alice Through Looking Glass, it's not terrible. It's not the worst. There are some things that I did like about it, but as a whole, if you didn't like the first movie, chances are you're really not going to like this one. <laughs> um, if you've seen trailers for this film and dismissed it, that is pretty much the feeling you're going to get from this movie, because it does pretty much the same thing the first film did. It disregards everything from the first book, from the book, and just does something entirely different, which would have been fine if it didn't embellish the title of the source material on the cover, which is weird because it's, it's called Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there, not Alice the Looking Glass, but go figure. Gotta tell it's a sequel to Alice in Wonderland. Um, I didn't have many problems with the first one, I thought it was okay, though over time, <laughs> time, uh, but over years of thinking back to it, it's one of those Tim Burton movies. I don't really look back upon that much with fondness. It's one of those movies where it's like, oh yeah, it exists. I, I, I admit the, the Disney version they did in 1951 is better, but it's going to sound weird because if I had to choose an Alice Wonderland adaptation that I felt worked from beginning to end, I'd probably go with the Hallmark version from the late 90s. <laughs> like, even that has problems too with the casting, like Whoopi Goldberg is Cheshire Cat, but as a book to film 
that is a book to movie translation, even if it is made for TV, it still gets the job done very well. And for like the shoestring budget it had, knowing it's television, there's some things that do work. I do admire the electro the animatronic work from Jim Henson's Creature Shop. Um, I do admire some of the casting choices, like Christopher Lloyd as the White Knight, even though he was from Through the Looking Glass and stuff like that. Martin Trent wasn't that bad as the Mad Hatter. I, I thought he was pretty decent. Um, Michelle uh, Miranda, sorry, Miranda Richardson playing the Red Queen. I thought uh, the Queen of Hearts. I thought she was perfect. <laughs> She's the ideal Queen of Hearts. I mean, she played her before in Blackadder too. Um, so that's ideal casting right there. Uh, but when it comes to the Tim Burton variation, I would be okay with it if it was just called Return to Wonderland. <laughs> Maybe the same thing with its sequel, Return to Wonderland 2. <laughs> the Quest for Peace. <laughs> which is quintessentially what this film is. Which is quintessentially what this movie, which is quintessentially what this movie is. Um, it, it's funny because the first book was really more like discovering this whole world and seeing these different kind of people, which even Tim Burton didn't really hold to heart that much. I actually read a couple uh, a couple of bits online saying that he wasn't too fond of Alice in Wonderland because there was not a plot associated to it, which is why he made a, a story to go with the first one. And even that didn't work. It's just... no. Alice in Wonderland, it's not Narnia, it's something entirely different. Alice is the straight person, you're going into this whole new environment, seeing all these different characters and stuff. There's not meant to be a plot. The plot is seeing Alice explore this whole new world, and judging from her reactions what kind of world it is. The second one, Through the Looking Glass, is a little more interesting, because it's a giant metaphor for chess. She's meeting these different characters, the same thing as the first book, but at the same time, she's moving like a pawn on a chessboard, which makes it a little more unique. Even there's like a little analogy near the end where they mention all the little movements that she did in the story and how it connects to chess, which I find very interesting. Um, but even then, this one does the same thing. It throws the original source out the window, tries to go for something different, and if I had to be honest, the first one was at least trying to be a different Alice in Wonderland movie. It's not a good movie, I, even I admit. But if, if it was on the, the the networks, or if it was on TV, I'd be like, all right, you know, it's either that or like whatever else is on. Um, but for the sequel, at least I'll give it this much. It's a little more colorful. And if it was, if it if it had the same color scheme as the first one, where it was dark and grim, and very like dark reds and murky colors, I probably wouldn't have liked it. I probably would have, you know, despised it a lot, because there are some weird dark detours once in a while um, when we get to like the real world with Alice, which I'm trying not to spoil too much, which I don't want to ruin too much, but. Let's just say there's one moment where it gets a little return to Oz for like just one minute. And it's like, oh, back to the quirkiness, which is really weird. <laughs> um, so, God, I'm saying um a lot. The heat's, the heat's getting to me. I'll try to, I'll try not to talk too much because I'm getting a little bushed. So in a nutshell, this film has like one tone too many. Like first it opens like parts of the Caribbean. Then it's uh, Amadeus with uh, Alice returning from China and learning that her family is under bankruptcy and stuff, and that the only will to save her family is to sell off her ship to the snooty guy from the first movie, who even then she rejected her his hand in marriage, and I guess he's doing it for revenge for those reasons, whatever reason, whatever. Um, and then it becomes... It starts to get a little interesting when we enter the, the realm of Underland. Um, when she goes to the mirror, and it, it, it starts off a little interesting, like, there's a bit where she, like, slides onto a chessboard and destroys Humpty Dumpty at accident, which is in the trailer. You, you get a good talent like Eric Idle, that's a problem I'm gonna bring up later. Um, you get a talent like Eric Idle, and you just have, like, him for, like, three or two lines. Genius! Okay. Get together. So then... There's this whole thing with the Mad Hatter who's getting depressed because apparently, as it turns out, he 
lost his family and doesn't know if they're alive or not. And so Alice is told, oh, you can find for yourself what happens when you meet with this villain called Time, and he has this little device where that's connected to this giant clock where if you remove it, it becomes this time machine, and you can go back in time, and... Ugh, okay. Right there, you can see my biggest problem. There's way too much being stuffed in. You already went from one story tone to the next, and the other, and the other. How does time travel relate to Alice in Wonderland? There's a possible way it could, but the way they pull it off is just so bizarre. <laughs> like... <sighs> okay. The first, like, 30 minutes are just a little dull because they're setting things up, you know, going back to this wonderful place and stuff. Um, you don't see much of Johnny Depp. I guess that's kind of a plus. Because Depp, uh, Johnny's not a bad actor, Johnny Depp's not a bad actor, but at the same time, it's like, his performance as the Mad Hatter was a little off. And I know he's supposed to be this mad, crazed character, but even then, there's just something about it that just didn't feel right. He just seems a little too crazed. This is a riddle man. This is the kind of guy that doesn't care about time. And yet, in this one, he just seems like a little too profound, like a very deranged Willy Wonka. Um, but there's really not that much from which I guess is a plus, everybody. <laughs> so, the time travel device they toss in this movie serves as an excuse to be a sequel and a prequel in really weird ways. Like, oh, we get to see these people as they were before, and at the same time we sort of connect the dots and see how... It's quintessentially Back to the Future and Back to the Future Part 2 if they were streamlining side by side, and then somewhere in the middle is Alice in Wonderland and Krull. This is just a weird movie. <laughs> I didn't care for it at all. Um, I'm not writing it off as a bomb, because there are some things I did enjoy, but I'll get to those in a moment. Here's what I didn't like about it. The casting is not as... I, it, it's the same people, which I'll give them credit for that, but it kind of feels like they're here for a paycheck. Like, I, bar I barely remember them getting, like, full devoted parts, because it's all CGI and stuff. Most of the time, when we see characters, again, like the Cheshire Cat, the, Matt, the March Hare, they really feel like they're bit parts. Like, they're there just because, hey, this is the Disney live-action Alice in Wonderland. They were there in the first one, so we might as well have them here. But they're not given big enough roles to actually expand upon. Um, it's directed by James Bobbin, who did the two Muppet movies, The Muppets and Muppets Most Wanted. And I kind of feel that he's not suited for this kind of family-oriented film, which is the fantasy aspect. Because when you're dealing with the fantasy, you're dealing with like, many characters, many associations of different relationships, like this person's connected with that person, all that sort of stuff. If they handed it to someone who had a good handle on fantasy and how to tell fantasy epics, like say Narnia, for example, again, just an example, maybe it would have worked. But here, a lot of characters get sidelined, rather than actually used for full purpose. They're there because, hey, it's Alice in Wonderland. And, oh, we need to show how Tweedledee and Tweedledum are, like, fighting sibling way. Oh, we need to see the Mad Hatter and how he came to be and all that sort of stuff. Oh, we need to see how there's this sibling rivalry between the Red Queen and the White Queen, which even then doesn't make any sense when you realize that the whole time, the few they had between each other is something so stupidly simple. <laughs> Um, but I guess it leads to a good moral, uh, You see, that's the problem with this movie. Every time there's a positive, every time there's a negative, there's like a positive. It's like, oh, oh, you have to say this is a good movie because it's using this trope, but it's using it in a good light, but, oh, no, 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 it contradicts it because of this little trope right here. And I want to go into reasons why, but I know the few people who actually want to see this really want to see this. So I guess I can give away a little bit. Just a little. Uh, it's revealed in the movie that the reason why they both split is because of something that the White Queen did in the past to the Red Queen. And because of this, I guess she has like this guilt conscience. And if she just did this certain action instead of just holding it in and just lying, she would have been okay. <laughs> so we really do realize all this time, this whole thing is set off by a small, simple thing. It becomes so pointless. 
just absolutely pointless for Alice to go on this big grand journey through different timelines and everything. And the same thing with the Mad Hatter, even though that is supposed to be an important storyline, it gets a little shoved in, uh, shoved to the side, so we can focus on this thing and that thing is, you know, I was all like, oh, maybe if this didn't happen, then this wouldn't happen, and oh my goodness, it gets so convoluted, it becomes a chase for a plot through time. <laughs> Which doesn't really make any sense, and it's shame because this is a movie that's supposed to be. This is a based on a story or a series of stories that's about nonsense. Things aren't supposed to make sense, and yet this film is trying to make a coherent narrative out of it when it really shouldn't. And again, through the Looking Glass wasn't about time; it was about chess, which made it all the more interesting. But even then, um, the the wrong choices they made in this film made it entertaining in sort of a bizarre way. <laughs> Like, it wasn't a train wreck. I'll, I'll give it that much. It wasn't a train wreck, like, God forbid, Tomorrowland. It was more like an enjoyable mess. Like, trying to see all these little points connect together and just sort of laughing and thinking to yourself, wow, I have no idea how they're trying to make it sense when it still isn't. <laughs> like, this is not a good movie, but I'm not going to write off and say it's like a fluke or a bomb. Because there are some things I did enjoy. Uh, there is a creativity to some of the sets, even though they're all digital. Half of the time it feels like you're just, there I go again, saying time. Well, time as in sitting and watching the movie. You're sitting there and seeing at least a couple of creative things here and there, like these little square streets and everything, but there's nothing that really felt like a full embodied environment. They're just, you're just sitting there watching sets. Even the sets in Babes in Toyland from the 1960s had more flair to it. <laughs> and even that looked fake. That had like uh, talking trees out of Sid Marty Croft. <laughs> This film, this movie, again, the heat's getting to me. This movie really tries to look like a spectacular kind of thing, but it just doesn't. The only time it looks interesting is when we're seeing, like, the mansion of the villain, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, so there's times where it looks okay, because at least there's some believable elements. There's some time. There's some points where a creature or something will look kind of interesting, like the little minions in the clock castle, which are kind of nice. But other than that, it's it's still a it's still an incoherent mess, because nothing really connects together. The only thing that brings the film truly together is the time travel plot, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But there is some like enjoyment out of it in such a weird way. Uh, the villain they got is played by Sasha Baron Conan. Uh, who's this villain named Time. Go figure. So there's an open room for all these puns about time and stuff, which is a shame, because they could have been funny and interesting, but for this kind of movie where it's supposed to be nonsensical, it doesn't work. Because <laughs> they're so predictable, like, oh, look, time is flying. Oh, look, wasting time. <laughs> oh, look, no time for this, no time for that. It's, it just... That's the only reason why he exists for certain scenes, but when it's just him being menacing with Alice and trying to be like this really bad villain, uh, that is when he got interesting to me. I'm not a fan of Sasha Baron Conan, but I will admit, there are times where I do see him in movies where he plays these side characters or villains per se, and that's when I think he's the most interesting because he's limiting his com comedy down. Because when he's doing like a star-studded vehicle, like say Borat or Bruno, that is when I think he gets a little too loose, because it's not very interesting comedy. It's shock value, trying to prove a point, and even then, the comedy that he's proving in his movies are sort of redundant. These are the kind of things you just go on YouTube and be like, oh, I get this point why they're doing this joke to prove so-and-so because of this politic kind of thing. That's quite essentially what his movies are becoming now. They're sort of redundant. So when he's playing a side character, that's what I think is interesting, because he's putting all his all into this little small thing, uh, he's not given too much room, but yet he takes what he has and just goes AWOL with it. Uh, it's sort of like the the security guard in Hugo with the, the wooden leg there. <laughs> like, it, it's pure proof that whatever whatever he's given in a film, whether it's a small role or like a side villain, he'll just really run with it. And I think he's really good in roles like that because he's being direct and he said, okay, here you go, here's this, you're this crazy robotic clock guy that is very hell-bent about time and wants to keep it in control. 
That's your motivation. And he just goes with it. And he puts his own little spin on it without going over the top or insane. Um, he's sort of like a Diet Coke Jim Carrey. He's a little more restrained. And I think that is when the movie works for me, is when he's on screen playing this really wibbly-wobbly, tiny-wimey kind of villain. His little clock beneath running around going, tick, 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 tick. That is what I think, that's where I think the movie holds up to me more with this villain. It's the only reason to see it. He's pretty much the horned king of the entire feature. He just walks around, does nothing, chases after Alice, talks about, you know, clocks, time, how life is short, and all this sort of stuff. That is where it only works me that most. Everything else just sort of feels very there. Like, it's a little, sl it's not like, you know, paced together with like needle and duct tape. It's not stitched together well, I think is what I'm trying to say. There's... Because, yeah, it's like... It, it's a typical ABC storyline kind of fantasy. Like, someone goes to a, a different world. There's a problem and a crisis. They gotta figure it out. Then problem gets out of hand. Then problem gets fixed. And then they have to say goodbye to everybody. And go back and they change to be a better person. When there really isn't much to fight for in this film. In this movie. Even with the first one, it was the same thing. It's just a hand in marriage and trying to grow up and be a better person. I'll give Through the Looking Glass this much, aside from the colorful look of it, which actually looks better than the first one. The moral doesn't feel tagged on. It's there. But I kind of wish it was developed a little bit more. Like, if it was given a much bigger story or something to work with, maybe it could have worked as a better film. And it's the whole idea of, you know, family is important uh, as much as your dreams are. Just make sure you have, like, a head on reality and know where you are. Yes, you can be who you are, but just remember that there's limitations. And always remember that someone is there and to make sure that they're all set. So, in, in short, you know, don't just focus on you, but focus others around you because they'll help you out and all that malarkey. It's not tagged on like a Hallmark card. I will give it that much. It's the other thing that makes it work. And there's points where they show it being, you know, connected and stuff, like the rival between the Red and White Queen and the Mad Hatter, who's in this big guilt trip because apparently he did something with his father and disagrees with it. Now they're like both split apart and he doesn't want to go back to his self assured dad who wants him to be more realistic like a real hatter should. It's that kind of movie. It's the basic Disney formula mixed in trying to be a generic fantasy film. And that's really the quintessential problem. It could have been better. It could have been unique. It could be interesting. The only time it nearly does when it takes this really dark turn <laughs> for, for a solid minute, surprisingly. Um, where for no apparent reason, they have this sequence where Alice tries to escape, and I don't know how. It feels like there's scenes missing here. Uh, spoiler, well, it's, a, it's in the trailer, so I can ruin it. Uh, somehow she ends up in a mental institution, <laughs> and there's all this little dialogue clips like, oh, they found you rummaging around trying to find this little device and stuff like that, and that's how you ended up here because you're blabbering nonsense and stuff, and she gets out of it really easily. Like, they could have made that, like, a whole big sequence, questioning whether she's insane or not and all that sort of stuff. But it just gets really sidelined. It's like it happens and then it just goes away. It's like a big lipped alligator moment, apparently. So, any given time it wants to take a risk and do something, it just sweeps under the rug and say, okay, back to the quirkiness. <laughs> it's trying to play it safe. It, it plays itself way too safe. That is the problem with the movie. It just plays itself a little too safe. And even when it does take a risk, it's really predictable. Like, you know something bad is going to happen with this ultra time machine device. You know it's going to end up in the wrong hands and it's going to mess up and stuff. It's it's not a movie that I would really recommend to see in theaters. Maybe as a rental, because there are some things in it that are enjoyable. Uh, but most of the time, half of the cast is there just for a paycheck. Anne Hathaway is just fluttering her arms around, just going, Woo -hoo -hoo, you have to go this way in that direction just to save the Mad Hatter. Woo -hoo -hoo. Uh, Alan Rickman, who sadly passed away in December or near the start of the year, gets only like three or two lines. He comes back as a caterpillar, but as a butterfly, and he only gets like three or two lines, which is a shame. Uh... It, I just really feel like there could have been a lot more done here. And I know they're trying to slim it down and keep a focus here, but when you have all these colorful characters, we should make, like, a story out of them or something, or maybe even have, like, this whole movie set in 
Underland or Wonderland, whatever you call it. That would have been more interesting, just seeing how the way the place works and everything. Forget about Alice, make the whole movie about that place. It just really feels like there's a lot of concepts here that are not being fully utilized. They could have been something great, they could have been something grand, but in the end they just feel really sidelined just for this one thing that literally goes nowhere. Uh, so yeah, am I disappointed that I saw this travesty, that people are calling it a travesty? I'm not disappointed. I'm glad I saw it to get an opinion out of it. That's really the basic gist. It's just not a movie I would fully recommend to the fullest. It's harmless, I'll give it that much. The moral they build around it is not like hammered in or anything, and at least it's colorful. I mean, the previous movie was like very dark and brooding, like it's a lighter film, but it's not the kind of movie that I would really care about that much. If it was on television and I had a friend with me, I'd probably sit there and just riff throughout the whole thing. <laughs> there isn't much of a risk, there isn't much to care for, it just, it's a film that exists. That's the only way to describe it. It's a film that exists. I'm it. I'm not mad at it. I'm not disappointed. I'm disappointed that there wasn't much creative thought put into it that much. I'd say if you really want, you know, a follow-up to this film we got, this movie we got six years later, which was supposed to be like the t uh, turning pinnacle point for Disney and everything, uh, all the power to you. If you enjoyed this, that's fine. I, I really don't hate it. It's just one of those films that is bad, but at least has a few good qualms for me to say that it's not as horrible of a train wreck that everyone's making it, but it's just one of those movies I wouldn't really watch that frequently. It, it's, it's the basic, typical, executive version of making a fantasy film for families. That's really what it is. Just take these things and just put them in a plot like this and then make the plot like this and, oh yeah, throw in a message like this. It's the Disney executive variation of an Alice movie. That's really what it is. I don't even think Tim Burton had much of an involvement on this film. He was just a producer. <laughs> I bet he was just sort of, you know, sitting back while he was directing the this whatever home for children and just signing checks or something, be like, oh yes, yes, this idea is fine, just just go with it, away with you, I think my delectable film for Fox. Um, that's all I got for it. It's it's forgettable. Aside from Sasha Baron Conan as the villain, that's really the only thing that I'm taking away from it. So yeah, that's that. Uh, hopefully things get better during the summer, and uh, till then, see you next time. <laughs> uh, I gotta pick up some milk.